Thank you, Kenneth. Um, and I'll just do a quick apology for everyone. Um, thank you for waiting two weeks to see this. Um, while I got over some bronchitis, though, um, still a bit of it. So I'll try to cough off screen and apologies if I'm coughing in your ear. Uh, so just to give you a bit of background about how this came about and a bit about what we're going to go over. Uh, over the last couple of years, uh, FAME has been responding to consultations from the Migrant Advisory Council. So we've responded to two. <coughs> One of those was to get us on the shortage occupation list, which I'll go over. Uh, but we've definitely had a pretty big interest, as Kenneth mentioned. Um, of, I'll go into the numbers in a bit, but quite a few of, our, of the staff in the sector of archaeology are not UK citizens. And so we've been working on this for several years. Uh, we've been putting together a review of the white paper and the upcoming changes for FAM members. <coughs> but with the FAM webinars, we thought it'd be best to actually put that review together as a presentation. And so this presentation is gonna go over a lot of the different routes, not all the routes, because not all of them are going to be relevant and a bit of an assessment of what we think employers and employees will be able to utilize in the system. Um, and just to give you a bit of background, I helped craft our response to Mac that got us on the shortage occupation list. Um, I also have a bit of personal experience on both ends of the um, visas. So I have did the long route 10 years um, to get to the uh, permanent leave to remain, and now citizenship. Um, I've also been on the other end of it, uh, helping an organization, Archaeology Scotland, go through the process and become a sponsor as well. And we've sponsored several people. So um, I'll be talking about mainly um, very technical stuff, but I'll throw in a bit of my personal experience from both ends, from both being an employer and being an employee on these routes. So um, a new system's coming on January 1st, uh, though if you want to get really technical, I don't think this is going to affect anyone, but it actually kicks in at 11 p.m. on December 31st. Uh, so if you're on a flight into the UK and it lands between 11 and midnight, it'll actually make a difference. I don't think that is going to affect many people, but just be very specific about that. Also, this new system really isn't new. It's a modification of the current system with a few changes. So why does this matter? Uh, well, if you're an employer and you do not, and you hire someone who is, you're not supposed to hire, that is up to a 20,000 pound fine. <coughs> As Kenneth and I had mentioned, uh, a fairly significant portion of our, of the, profession in the UK are non-UK citizens. And a fairly significant portion of students in the UK are also non-UK citizens. So they'll be affected by this new uh, changes coming into effect. Uh, actually, quite a few of them are already um, outside the EU and affected by it as well. Um, and also, I'd like to think that uh, people care about this on a personal level in that uh, the whole sector is trying to better ourselves and not discriminate against people because of how they were born. So um, there is that matter as well. So this new system, um, <coughs> it's not really a new system. It's basically a tinkering of the current system only now going to be applied to people who were <coughs> EU citizens but not UK citizens. You'll, you'll hear a lot of um, talk around this. It's not a new points-based system. The UK has had a points-based system since the 2000s. And it, um, to be honest, it's not really a points-based system. 
um, you need to score all the points basically to get a, uh, a visa, um, whereas the old, an old true points-based system would have been one where uh, the example they like to use is um, Australia. Um, usually when the government's putting out something, I'm sure somewhere they did some sort of test or survey to find that people really enjoy the term Australia or think highly of Australians. And so they like to throw it in front of it, but the UK actually had a points-based system. And it's not anywhere close to the Australian system where you could trade off points. So, you know, you got more points for being younger, more points for having a higher wage. Um, the UK system, really, there is no trade off. You basically get points for being able to speak English <laughs> and points for having a job. And that's the only way you can get points and you have to get all those points. Um, so it may, there's a lot of rhetoric around this, but really it's not a points-based system, um, even though you're gonna hear <laughs> the government discuss it as a points-based system. The most important part to remember <coughs> is almost all the rules we're gonna discuss are changed by statutory instruments. So um, they change quite often. Uh, there's usually several changes a year. And um, essentially what this means, other than the most recent having to switch over EU citizens into the, to not be applied under the general uh, UK citizen rights, that's the only thing that's passed in the laws. Everything else, everything that you're gonna see is actually implemented through statutory instruments, which means the government can change it at any point and they do quite often. Um, just a fair warning to people who are considering going to do this route, um, it is very much a hostile environment. Uh, it's been a rhetoric for about 10 years to try to get under 100,000 people immigrating to the UK in a given year. That is not physically possible. Uh, the definition counts anyone who plans to stay for 12 months or more. A student visa for a one-year master's is anywhere between 12 and 16 months. So any student, unless they're doing a very short course, will count as an immigrant. Um, whether they they'll be able to stay or plan to stay, they're counted. Um, last year, there was over 200,000 students not from the EU who came. Um, <clears throat> so even with this new applying these rules to EU citizens, um, there is no way it is ever going to get below 100,000 people in normal circumstances. Uh, this year, it may have. Um, we'll have to wait to see when the numbers come out. Um, but we're talking events like a global pandemic is going to stop that. But what that means is that uh, the current government has this goal that is not reachable, but they keep trying to reach it. Um, so they make changes several times a year, um, always usually tightening the rules. So when I was under the regime for over a 10 year period, there was only one change they ever made that was positive uh, for us and helped us out. Every other rule um, reduced our options and made it worse for us. <coughs> They've also deputized effectively all employers and landlords. So all employers need to check people's uh, ability to work and all landlords, at least in England, need to check people's ability to live there. So um, basically the government has placed off a lot of their duties onto other people in the private sector to manage and try and enforce a lot of their regulations around immigration. So it this is the sort of situation that we're currently in. Um, maybe that will change in the future, but for at least the last decade, um, it is not a happy place to be. Um, it's not something I would recommend anyone goes through the process, uh, but not everyone has that option. So just to go over a couple of things, um, this is not going to apply to citizens of Ireland. Uh, there was a common travel area. It predated the EU. I should also mention this includes things like the Isle of Man and Jersey. 
It was updated. So a memorandum of understanding was signed by both the Irish and UK governments to actually add a lot more detail to this um, a year ago. Um, and this is just a thing, but the main important part is any British or Irish citizen can work in the other country and have a bunch of other rights as well. Uh, so this new regime is not going to apply to anyone that has Irish citizenship. Though, if you're an Irish citizen and you have a non-Irish citizen, non-UK family member, you do have to go through extra work uh, to be able to bring them with you. <coughs> Another thing to be aware of for uh, employers, um, if you have employees, and I know this applies to a, a couple of organizations who <coughs> work in other countries, they can get what is called uh, frontier workers. Uh, that permit scheme is going to launch <coughs> on December 10th. So um, if you have someone currently working for you or will start working for you before the 31st of December, who's based in a different country, but is employed by you, so they're paying you know, national insurance, they're on, the, on your payee, your taxes in the, uh, the UK, they can also get a permit that eventually allows them to come and live and work in the UK uh, later uh, if they want to as well. Um, similarly, any EU citizens who have arrived before, well, midnight, but you know it's uh, midnight Brussels time, can apply for the EU settlement scheme. So again, any EU citizens who are currently living in the UK or will come over before the end of the year, they can do this scheme. Uh, both these schemes are free and you, you, they basically give you a permit and you'll be able to work um, in the UK. So you can hire, going forward in the new year, you can hire any of these people as well as they can, they'll have the right to work in the UK too. <coughs> so now I'm gonna go through some of the visas. So, um, just to kick it off, there is what used to be the old tier one visa that was renamed uh, February, uh, beginning of this year, uh, end of last year. But essentially it is the old tier one uh, visa just with a little bit extra to it. Um, this visa is something that an individual can get. You don't need to be uh, sponsored by an employer, employer which is great. You can actually do self-employed work. Um, almost in any other visa you get, uh, they will not be able to do self-employed work or other work. You can change jobs, go to anyone. You don't need to tell the home office. Um, there's no language requirement. Um, there's no minimum salary. And you can get indefinite leave to remain after three years, which means you no longer have to go get visas to stay, um, which is very nice. It's the shortest way you can get that. Uh, some disadvantages, though, is <coughs> we're still waiting for the new numbers, but up to half the people who apply for this uh, don't get it. And I'll explain this process. It's very different than some of the other visas. Um, it used to be that there was a 2000 limit. And then when they switched this to the global talent or renamed it, they took away that limit. But they almost never reached that limit. Um, and I'm going to go over the process. It's a bit different. Uh, <coughs> in areas of tech, they meet, they missed it. Uh, they met that limit. Uh, but like in the engineering areas, only 20% of their allocated ones were ever given out. Uh, so you're actually talking about a very small number of visas that this and a very small number of people this will affect. However, I think our, some archaeologists will be well placed to take advantage of it. Um, again, we're going to go over this, how you can, a lot of the other visas, basically you meet the criteria, you don't, it's really easy, um, and you'll know if you'll get it or not, unless you make a mistake on your application. Uh, this one, it's not quite as simple. We'll go into that. <coughs> and just to let you know, uh, these are sort of the costs you're looking at at the moment. Um, they usually increase these every sort of spring. So uh, potentially these costs will be going up. The healthcare surcharge, 
which is paid by everyone on almost any visa uh, is paid for the NHS, uh, though you'll see that a lot of these are work visas in which you'll be paying taxes anyways. Uh, so in effect, it's a double taxation. Uh, this is a visa that might be an option for people who are single, but as you can see, um, if you have a family, you're probably gonna be paying just for a three-year visa for four of you, almost 10,000 pounds. And you have to pay that at the beginning. So you have to have 10,000 pounds on hand. Uh, so uh, you'll see with a lot of these visas, um, it may not be practical for many people. <coughs> what makes this visa different is you need to get an endorsement. Um, there's a couple of endorsements and this is just the timelines. Uh, you can get a fast track, which you get back in a week. Um, sometimes it can take up to eight weeks if you're doing peer review and your visa usually takes about three weeks. So um, you can apply for your visa and endorsement at the same time. If not, you're looking at close to three months in this process to get this sort of visa. One route to do this, and this is the expanded route with the new visa. Uh, you used to not be able to get this under tier, when it was a tier one visa. Um, <coughs> is basically, if you've ever got, it applies to most academics. So um, if you've got a job as a senior academic, um, if you got an individual fellowship and there's a massive list of fellowships. Uh, so if you've got funding, I'll show you some examples. Um, or if you've got a research grant from any of the research councils, you can basically get this uh, right away. And so that's why I think it's applicable to quite a few archeologists. Um, people who might be going for a PhD or have done a postdoc and have done a postdoc on say, a <coughs> Arts and Humanities fund council, Funding Council grant might be able to uh, qualify. Uh, the other way of going about this is through the arts and culture sort of way. So if you qualify under that, um, most of it is Arts Council England. However, and I've just listed some of these other ones, other organizations have basically been brought in by Arts Council, and they're actually paid to do this, to look at and come up with criteria. Uh, so FAME, we had a discussion about a year ago uh, with the Royal Institute of Architects, um, Royal Institute for British Architects. And FAME has looked into being one of the sort of clearing houses. Um, the problem with this is you have to have a criteria. And some of the criteria, so for film and television, winning an Academy Award, winning a BAFTA, or a, a equivalent award for that. Or with architects, you sort of have to submit a CV, um, have to have done some major showings and stuff like that. And this is why actually the rates of um, getting these visas are maybe around 30 to, you know, 30 to 50% of the people don't get them is because there's not very clear criteria. It's great if you have a BAFTA, that automatically gets you in. Uh, but if not, you're basically sending this off to these organizations who will judge you. Um, and, and that's same for the research uh, that you can now go for a peer review and they'll judge you um, and say, yes, you might be a world leading person or you might not be. Um, so it's actually a fairly big risk. And another risk is if you get denied, you lose the money you put in for your visa. <clears throat> Last one, which may apply to some archeologists doing some digital technology. Um, there is that, it's a lot of criteria, um, but some of it is if you've worked on new techniques and stuff like that. So maybe some archeologists doing 3D work or photogrammetry or stuff like that might be able to qualify, um, but it's a bit iffy. So our assessment of this or sort of route is it's not applicable to most archeologists, but if you, have a PhD, have done some research, maybe a postdoc, it may work for you. Um, it is incredibly flexible. It is the most flexible visa you can get. Um, if you're getting it, you can work for any employer. They don't need to be a sponsor. Um, three years to get indefinitely to remain. It's great stuff. Um, like I was saying, it's a bit risky, but there are some um, automatic ways of getting it. So. Uh, just to show you, again, there's a massive list you could have to look up. 
Uh, but some people who may have got these sort of fellowships uh, through the Arts and Humanities Research Council, or again, there's a bunch of other awards. You could have got a BAFTA or Academy Award for all those archeologists um, doing documentaries. Uh, those basically are the fast track applications where it's automatic because you hold one of these fellowships or have in the last five years and, or won an award or something like that. Um, if <laughs> anyone is going for this, we definitely recommend if you can qualify, do the fast track because uh, you're guaranteed. If not, you're going through a peer review and you may or may not get it. <coughs> so this is the main one. This is the one we think that will be most applicable to most people. Um, this is a tier, what is now called a tier two, will be soon be changed to be called a skilled worker route. Um, so I'm gonna go through the process of how you apply. If you're applying now, you'll actually be applying to be a tier two sponsor, but just know the terminology is going to change in about a month and a half, actually a little less than a month and a half. So, um, this is a sponsored route, which means you need to have an employer sponsor you. Um, some advantages is that there's no longer a limit to it. Well, again, uh, there won't be a limit come the first. Uh, currently, there still is a limit of 20,000 of these visas. Uh, so if you are planning on hiring any staff in the next month, we'd recommend you wait until at least the 1st of January. That's a whole different process. <coughs> the requirements are straightforward. Um, you either meet the requirements or you don't. How you get rejected is if you made a mistake on your application. Um, or there's, you know, there's a few things that also criminal convictions, things like that can also disqualify you as well. But there is no peer review. Um, you either get it or you don't because you haven't met the qualifications. There's no sort of iffy going to a panel who may or may not think what you do is important. It's going to be much easier. Um, it, currently, you have to do a labor market check, which means that you can only hire uh, UK and EU citizens uh, first. Um, and basically, that's if they meet the minimum requirements. So you could have someone from somewhere else who maybe had 20 years of experience, but on your job description, if you said you only needed two, they have to hire the person from the UK who had two. Um, it's the person Basically, anyone who meets the minimum qualifications who's based in the UK, you have to hire. Um, you had to use to have, have to advertise for 28 days. Um, and again, there used to be limits on how many of these could be given out, <coughs> which made it difficult. Um, you can get indefinitely to remain. Again, as I discussed, uh, with indefinitely to remain, you can stay. Uh, you don't need to be on visas. You basically can work wherever. Um, you're not tied to your employer. Um, and now there's going to be no minimum salary. So it used to be to, after this visa, you'd have to have made roughly around 37,000, 38,000, which if you've worked in archaeology, you know that's a bit difficult. Um, that salary minimum is going away, which is nice. Um, the best way to describe the disadvantages for this I'm gonna go through the process of what you have to do to apply for this. So the process from the employer's point of view, <coughs> you have to apply to be a sponsor. Um, there's a few criteria there. Uh, you know, you have to have no criminal history. Um, you can't have had been a sponsor in the past and completely failed, things like that. It's an online form. <laughs> when you do it, you can apply for tier two and tier five. Um, I'll come back to tier five visas. And again, if you're going through this process, it's going to be called anywhere in this process between now and uh, January, it's going to be called a tier two, but it is going to be changing the terminology in the future uh, to uh, a skilled worker. You then have to have staff who can ma <coughs> manage this. Basically, once you get it, um, you're given an online portal. Um, staff members are given access, and those are the people who then go through the process with other people and uh, issue certificates, which I'll come on to. Costs, um, if you're a small or small organization or, ch or charity, uh, it's only 536, 
uh, medium or large organizations, which their qualifications is something like turnover of over 3 million or more than 30, 50 employees. That's the cost there. So about three times the cost, uh, but still pretty low. Um, when you're going for certificates and this process and going to apply, uh, you could actually pay uh, 8,000 pounds to get a premium service where they'll do it pretty much instantly. Otherwise, you're looking at an eight to 10 week uh, wait. So if you started now, you probably won't be able to hire anyone until the end of January at the earliest. Or, and you'll see this a lot with <coughs> a lot of the visas and the process, you can spend a little bit more money and they'll process it faster. So if you're hoping to hire someone, let's say January 1st, um, and you're going for an application soon, uh, you could pay an extra 500 and basically get it done in 10 working days, about two weeks. <coughs> so we've gone through this process. Um, I've gone through it uh, with Archaeology Scotland. Uh, there's two ways it happens when you do um, an application. We had this happen to us. Uh, some of the paperwork we put in was not on letterhead on every page. Um, and so they rejected it, except they didn't quite reject it. They withdrew our application and told us to resubmit with the corrected forms. And when we did that, we didn't have to, we didn't lose the money we put in for the application. Um, they basically just sent us our stuff back. We refilled it, sent it back in and got it. Um, they do not have to do that. It is something nice that they do, uh, but if they do straight out reject you, um, you lose your fees. Uh, so a lot of times they'll be kind and just withdraw your application if there's a small mistake. Um, but they, if they reject it, say you went in there but had a criminal conviction that disqualified you, they'll reject it and you'll lose your fees. And also you can't reapply for a while as well. Once you've got your application through and you've been accepted, <coughs> um, you have to have a job that qualifies. Because we got, <coughs> sorry, excuse me for a second. Apologies, everyone. <coughs> uh, um, because we got archaeology on the short occupation list, um, that knocked down the minimum to about 20,800. Um, if archaeology wasn't on that, the minimum for the salary would be much higher. Um, that's basically the only um, requirement going forward that you need for this. Um, then you need to find someone to hire. Once you've decided on someone, uh, you go into this online computer system managed by the people that you've told them that will manage it. You have to fill in some paperwork. You have to do a job description. Uh, a job description is key. Um, there's advantages to being an archaeologist, so you have to put it in the job description about archaeology. Um, definitely try to include archaeology in the job title. The people reviewing these are not experts in archaeology or most fields. They have no idea what the job is. They're basically looking at it and saying, yeah, that seems like it's something an archaeologist would do. Um, and so it's best to also have the job title, have archaeology somewhere in it. You enter in all these details online, you pay this fee of 199 pounds, and then you get a cost, which is a certificate of sponsorship. Um, and actually it's just a bunch of letters and numbers that you then give this uh, code to your uh, potential employee and they use that for their application. Again, very important why uh, archeology span being on the shortage occupation list, um, if you weren't, and so this is for also uh, hiring non-archaeologists uh, for non-archaeology, no, not, not hiring non-archaeologists, hiring people for non-archaeology jobs. Um, my suggestion is even if they're doing geophysics, call it archaeology geophysics, um, anything, just make it as archaeology related as possible because uh, jobs that are not on the short occupation list have to pay <coughs> a skills surcharge. Um, and if you're a, a large organization, uh, over a five-year visa, that's going to be 5,000 pounds that you have to pay. Um, and you have to pay this at the beginning. Um, you can get a refund, let's say if someone leaves before the end of those five years, uh, but you need to put down that money right away. 
Um, there's exceptions. So if someone was coming from being a student in the UK straight into a job, uh, a PH le PhD level job, um, they call it PhD level because of the requirements. You don't need to have a PhD to do it. <coughs> Archaeology currently comes under that. So um, shortage occupation list mainly helps for the salary. If you if you word everything right, you'd also be able to skip uh, the skill surcharge if we weren't on the shortage occupation list. Um, but that's basically you're saving thousands of pounds um, from archaeology being on the shortage occupation list and being a PhD level job. Uh, this is just to give you a bit of the costs that you're looking at. So those are the costs to start, uh, cost per certificate. Um, Potentially other costs if you want to get things sped up um, on your process. Um, and then if you don't have an exception, so if you're hiring someone who's not an archaeologist, maybe an accountant or something like that, um, you are also looking at between two and five thousand pounds, depending on the size of your organization, to be able to hire that person. Process from the uh, employee. Um, you need to be able to demonstrate that you speak English, which means you either have to have a qualification. They usually accept, like, say, a UK degree um, from a UK university means that you would have had to have known enough English to get that, things like that. Also, certain countries are automatic. So uh, Canada, United States, Australia. If you're coming from one of those countries, you don't need to demonstrate you can speak English. Um, one that's sort of a bit annoying is you also need to demonstrate that you have a certain amount of money in your bank account. Uh, though employers, if they want to, when going through the process of issuing you a cost, can also vouch that they would cover 945 pounds if, for example, you came and didn't have any money to start out work. Uh, these are the costs on the storage occupation uh, list, which archaeology is. Um, this is what it normally is. So by being on the shortage occupation list, um, we're saving potential employees several hundred, if not thousands of pounds in fees. Uh, you can't get over this. Almost every uh, visa comes with the health surcharge. Uh, it recently went up. It was only 400 something. And then at the end of October, it went up to 624. Um, and yes, this is a work visa, means you have to have a job, you have to be paying U UK taxes, so you will already be paying for the NHS, uh, but you also have to pay the surcharge on top of that. So you're being double taxed. Um, again, with this visa, if you're bringing over a family, 13,000, almost 14,000 pounds, um, potentially next year when they raise the fees, it would be about 14,000 uh, pounds. <coughs> a single person, you're looking at, you know, for five years, you know, 3,000 some pounds. Here's the times for the applications. Uh, it's quicker if you're outside um, the UK, but it is also a bit difficult. Um, <coughs> most are done in three weeks, but it could take up to 12 weeks. So if you have a job starting next month, um, you basically have these other options, which is you can pay extra money to get the visas uh, done quicker. So if you need someone to start next week or within a week, um, you can basically pay 500 or 800 extra pounds when you're doing your application to get it turned around um, almost instantaneously. Uh, the one to two days is something about if you have an appointment on a weekend, they won't get back to you till Monday. Uh, but if you say had an appointment on Monday, you'd find out on Tuesday. <coughs> this is just my personal experience. Um, we have always paid the extra money to go in person. It used to be you actually went and talked to someone uh, from the office who was a government employee. Uh, they have now outsourced this. Um, but it did save us a lot of money. Uh, several years ago, we went there, but we were applying to the, we couldn't imply, apply in country because we were switching from a different visa. Um, if we had done that by mail, they would have rejected it and we would have lost a thousand pounds. We went in person to Glasgow. Uh, they basically withdrew our application, told us we need to do something else. Um, basically, my wife had to leave the country to be able to reapply 
Um, it was a cheaper visa, but the money we saved from not having to lose that thousand, we were able to pay for a plane ticket out of the country so she could apply to come back in. Um, but if you're not doing in person, um, that and they don't have to do this in person, they could still have rejected us. Um, that was just them being nice. Uh, same thing happened when we went for indefinite leave to remain. We went out to Glasgow. This is the new system where it's uh, outsourced. Um, and so they actually just check your documents to make sure that they're correct before submitting them onto the home office. Um, but again, we had missed one of our documents. Uh, they were kind enough. I took the train all the way back to Musselboro, came back in the afternoon. They let me in. They let me add the one document that we had missed. And again, that would have saved us. 4,000 pounds if we got rejected. Um, so sometimes it is worth it to go through and pay the extra money because um, you get to see, at least see a person in an actual person. It's not through mail. And if they're feeling happy that day, they may just withdraw your application instead of reject it or give you chances to make corrections uh, that you won't be able to do through the mail. Um, <coughs> This is just to say there's also a different version of the tier two intercompany transfer. That is if you are a large organization that has workers in different countries, uh, just a, some, it's basically everything I've gone over, um, just slightly different requirements. That is someone to do that has to have been working for you for a year or a graduate trainee. And this has to be for a specialist position, only three months, um, but there is no discount. There's no shortage occupation discount uh, fee. So you're paying the full fees for visas. And this is sort of our assessment of how we think this is gonna be for the sector. Um, we do not see this as being workable for most say technicians, diggers, excavators, uh, however you wanna call the, the term. Um, it's, you know, weeks to find out unless you're willing to pay several thousand more. Um, you have to apply for at least a year visa. Um, <coughs> so, the employer or employee, um, you know, employers can pay the health surcharge fee if they want or the visa fees, um, or it could be up to the employee. Uh, you guys would have to work that out. Um, but you're looking at, you know, for maybe a couple of months of work, several thousand just to get a visa for someone to do this. Um, it comes pretty close to modern indentured servitude. Uh, visas are tied to the employer. Um, so you cannot go and work for someone else once you've got this visa. You have to work for your employer who is the sponsor. If you switch employers, you have to go through the process all over again and you have to pay fees again. So you have to pay for a whole new visa. So <clears throat> again, in uh, a lot of archaeology where you're, you know, a couple months at one company, a couple months at another, um, <clears throat> each time you're paying several hundred, if not thousands. Uh, sometimes you can get, so if you've paid the health surcharge, you might be able to get some of that counted towards, you know, a new visa, uh, may not be able to. You really have to trust your employer. Um, if you bring over dependents, they're tied to your job, so they can work. But if you lose your job, they lose their right to work. Um, <coughs> and you have no right to public funds. Um, so basically, if, if the job ends for any reason, you get no unemployment support, nothing like that. And depending on how your visa ends or the job ends and whatnot, you have one to two months to leave the country. So essentially you have no support, you're unemployed. If you have a spouse, they're unemployed at that point as well. Um, and you have to either go back to your home country with you, know, you or maybe you and your spouse um, not having any jobs and having no support for those last month or two. Um, so it, it's a lot of risk. Um, and basically you're at the whim of your employer um, because there is not a lot of tier two sponsors at the moment in archeology, span um, <clears throat> your odds of getting another job are very, very low. <clears throat> we think this is probably doable for people who have staff that are either permanent or looking to be long-term. Um, obviously there's a drawback of the cost, but it is, um, it's not that grave a cost. Um, 
for some people. Again, you know, some people coming over with families, that's going to be 10,000 pounds. That probably is not doable, but uh, for others, um, it could be. And with the new system, it is definitely much more accessible. There's no limits on how many visas could be given out. Uh, there's no requirements that you have to have given it to the best, the minimum qualified person in the UK, all things like that. So it is doable. Um, we think this might be taken up in the dozens is what we're looking at. This in the tier one, we probably expect maybe a few dozen people over the years to take it up. Um, and probably for sort of permit staff, people who are either higher up in management or specialists, someone who has a very specialist skill. <coughs> this is just to let you, uh, give you some information on some other visas. So uh, just because you're not a, if you're an employer and you decide not to be a tier two sponsor, um, don't necessarily reject someone right off the bat. Uh, there are a couple other visas they could possibly get um, that would allow them to work for you. Uh, same for you know, people who are looking to come work here in the UK. Um, there are some other visas that you can look into uh, that might allow you to work here. So there's the UK ancestry visa, um, basically, all Commonwealth citizens, um, not the USA. I think there was an issue with some tea in a harbor that made that not happen. Um, you have to be applying from outside the UK, so you can't be here as like a student or trying to switch from like a tier two because your uh, visa ran out and stuff like that. Um, basically, you have to prove when your grandparents was born in the UK. Um, also, Ireland before 1922. Though Ireland also um, allows anyone with an Irish grandparent to claim Irish citizenship. And as we mentioned, common travel area, um, I would probably recommend people go for the Irish one because you also are an EU citizen as well. So there's more benefits from that, but um, it's still an option. Um, <laughs> yeah, show that you plan to work in the UK. That means you need to have like a job offer or a business plan. Uh, again, this is what I'm telling. Uh, saying this to employers, don't quite, uh, uh, don't tell people they can't right away, see if it's a possibility. Um, if they may be able to get a UK ancestry visa, in which case they could come work for you. Um, it's not tied to employers as well. Um, it's up to five years. So you could hire people on UK ancestry visas. Uh, this is very brief. Um, there's so many regulations and stuff. This is just to give you a, a, a heads up, sort of some ideas, not necessarily go into the same depth as I went into with the tier two. Uh, this is the costs. Um, <coughs> another option is there's a post-study work uh, visa. Um, currently, there's a if you're a PhD student, you can get a one-year visa where you can work for anyone. Um, it actually counts towards your time for indefinite leave to remain. <coughs> um, sometime in the summer of 2021, this is going to be changing, and it's going to be expanding not just PhDs, but master students as well, um, and it'll be two to three years. Uh, it's not quite clear. They haven't come out with the exact uh, regulations, but it may not count towards indefinite leave to remain. Uh, but basically, anyone who, who's got a degree from a UK university will be able to work for a couple of years afterwards um, for anyone, so they, they'll have the right to work. So again, uh, if you have students uh, or students come to you and ask you if, if there's jobs, um, starting in about six months, there's more options for them. Um, and so they might be able to come work for you. Please pass that on to the students. Um, <coughs> again, it's the same fees as you have for a tier four student visa plus the health surcharge. Um, another one is uh, <laughs> between 18 and 30 from these countries. Um, you can come and work for two years. Those are the fees and health charge. Again, a possibility for some people. Um, there, <laughs> there might be one or two archaeology companies from outside the UK who maybe wants to send someone over to set up a branch or some sort of subsidiary. Um, you can do that. You can get basically a three year and then you can add extra two years to it. It's a visa. There, again, there's some other requirements. That's the cost. Again, you have to pay the health surcharge. Uh, but archaeology and heritage organizations from other countries could send someone over here 
um, and give them a visa. So here's a few others. I don't think anyone's going to be really able to use them, but you never know. Um, if you have two million pounds, well, you're willing to invest in the UK. Um, there's an innovator, uh, which means you have to have an organization, you know, you probably are already in the UK, you've started a company and someone's invested 50,000 into it. Um, there's also a startup. So if you're looking to start up companies, um, there's a lot of university programs that basically have the ability to be the sponsor for that. Um, I'm not sure what the other organizations, the business organizations are, but if you're say a student and you have an idea for a heritage or archeology span business, uh, check with your university's business support department or um, they'll have some sort of name for it. Most of them are these sort of sponsors for a startup visa. Um, so you basically pitch your idea to them and then uh, they'll say yes or no and they can give you a startup visa. Um, a lot of people end up marrying someone who's British and get a spouse visa. Um, <clears throat> there are a ton more visas I haven't covered because I just don't think they're relevant, um, but you never know. You could maybe want to become a domestic servant for someone um, or a temporary farm worker. Again, I don't think that was applicable to archeologists. I have just been covering the ones I think are relevant. And just to end, uh, I'd mentioned earlier that charities when they're applying for a tier two visa can also apply for a tier five. Uh, I've run a program with this. Um, it runs for one year. Someone can come and volunteer with your charity. Um, it's much cheaper. It's only 21 pounds to issue a certificate. Um, and again, to pay for it, you basically you tick a box when you're applying for your tier two sponsorship and you can get tier five for free. Um, people can come over. They can volunteer for you for a couple hours a week, uh, maybe a day or two here or there um, a week. And then they can also work 20 hours in the same field or any job on the storage occupation list. Um, <coughs> that's the cost. We have done three of these. I've personally helped go through with three of these. I, there is, at least in my experience, a type, which has been, um, it has been women who have found UK-based partners, uh, but haven't married yet, and so um, don't have the option of a spouse visa. They've contacted us. We said yes. They come over, volunteer for a few hours, uh, work a bit uh, in other archaeology jobs, and are basically stay with their partners for about a year, and then um, <coughs> uh, eventually move on to spousal visas. Uh, that's our experience with it. I'm not sure maybe other people would run different programs and different things would happen. Um, I would like to say if any employers are thinking about this, uh, please please think about it morally and that uh, you shouldn't have someone volunteering for you for 40 hours a week just to come over. Uh, they should have time to be able to work elsewhere um, and you know be able to support themselves. Uh, we try to keep it as minimum of, as possible for the volunteering. So that's the option there. Uh, <coughs> one thing I haven't covered is that there are tons of little bits of regulations for each visa. So um, just to give you an example, if you're on the doctoral uh, extension visa, you can't work as a dentist or a stripper. Um, it's those little tiny things that will maybe possibly catch you up. There's tons of regulations. Um, and again, they're always changing them. Uh, this is not legal advice, uh, but if you're looking for advice, I would definitely not recommend uh, you go to their hop, their their call-in line. Uh, basically, it costs a ridiculous amount, several pounds a minute, and they just read off the regulations that you can find on the website. Uh, they don't clarify anything for you, so uh, they'll just read off what's already been written. Um, so it's not worth it. So please do not go to the hotline. Um, Though once you are a sponsor, there is a number to call. Um, I've had mixed results. Sometimes I call and they're really great and great advice. And other times um, they read off the regulations to me. I ask them for an interpretation of what that means. And they say they don't know. Uh, so it's a bit mixed, but there is other options. Um, also, there are plenty of uh, 
solicitors, um, law firms that deal with this sort of thing. So if you need more advice um, and for the very specific tiny details, I would definitely suggest uh, paying professional for it. Um, and it's also just to say, uh, all of this is going to date very, very quickly. Um, again, it's statutory instruments, so they can change it whenever they want. Uh, the most recent change was only a couple of days ago, and the next change is coming in a couple of days. Uh, so these regulations are changing quite fast. Uh, if you're watching the recording of this video, um, if this is more than a, a few months since now, uh, definitely, definitely check the regulations. They would have changed maybe two or three times. Um, they usually change them about three or four times a year. So uh, it's really, really hard to keep up with everything because they're always tweaking them. Um, maybe usually for the worst for uh, potential immigrants, but uh, the last big change has made it easier for some people, worse for others, so it's a bit mixed. Maybe they'll make it better in the future. Um, but we'll just go to questions now. Well, uh, th thank you very much, Doug. That was very, very informative. Only, only very lightly <laughs> treasonous. Good, good. You kept that carefully. You, you sailed close to the to the wire there. Now, I think Doug is at the moment switching everyone over so that you'll be able to ask questions <coughs> yourselves. And I hope that people will have um, a range of questions. There were a lot of things in there that I wanted to ask about. Ah, but I am reminded at this point, something I didn't say at the very beginning. This webinar is being brought to you thanks to a grant that FAME have received from Historic England from the COVID Emergency Relief Fund. So we must thank uh, Historic England for supporting us in this, delivering this uh, event. Um, okay. As soon as everyone's live, I know that Chris Dorr did ask a question in the Q and A. But before we get there, I'm going to take I'm going to take my my bite at the cherry to ask you one quick question: the charity visa. That's very interesting. Could someone come over on a charity visa and volunteer at non-specific archaeological trust, a charity, for 20 hours a week, and work for that same trust? in a paid position for 20 hours? Not, you can't work for the same, uh, the same charity, but you can work for anyone else. So say if there was a large nondescript uh, charity based in the Southwest of England and they brought over a volunteer, they could then go work for maybe a large archeology span charity based in London. Or yes, yeah, so in, in just imagining if one was in, say Oxford and one was in Salisbury, just for example. Okay, for example. Yeah. thank you, Doug. That, that's, that's an important and interesting uh, point. Yeah. That, that's the thing is um, I've gone over the sort of higher level stuff, but there are all sorts of little tiny rules. Um, you have to basically go through the several hundred pages of guidance and regulations and look just to make sure um, there will be little things that will catch you out like that. Um, it actually used to be that you could keep someone on that visa almost indefinitely. Um, you could just keep renewing, but one of the most recent changes, unfortunately it affected one of the people we were sponsoring. Um, they basically got, they, they said you can no longer do it. There has to be a cooling off period between your tier five. So you could, you could volunteer for a year, take a year off, come back and volunteer for a year. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's, and they're always changing those regulations. So you have to be very careful. Um, to Chris's question, um, what about less than 12 months? Um, Doug, you love, if, if, yeah. Yeah, let me rephrase that because I asked that very near the beginning and thank you for a super informative presentation. I did get mixed up on the timeline because you started talking about greater than 12 months and before you went into the tier one, tier two. And then my, my question was kind of couched in, you know, project hires for a shorter time, which then kind of near the end, you touched upon a little bit, but it's still uh, a little foggy to me about 12 yeah. months, greater than less than. So thanks. So again, this is a change. They used to have like a temporary worker where you could basically come over for, companies could bring in someone else for like six months, um, a com company transfer, stuff like that. Um, 
with all the changes, you basically have to give someone a minimum, a visa for a minimum of a year, even, uh, so you, you have to give them the visa for a year, even if they're, the project's only for six months or three months or something like that. Um, so you, you have to pay the full health, you have to pay a health surcharge for a year. Um, basically, you have to pay everything like it is at least a minimum of, of a year. Technically, you could bring someone for three months and then fire them um, after you've paid for a visa for a year and then they leave. They have to leave because they've lost a job, which means you lose the visa as well. Um, like I mentioned, it's somewhat close to modern indentured servitude. Um, you have to have a lot of trust. Uh, employees have to have a lot of trust with their employers um, and vice versa. Um, I, I think it's a bit rough, a bit tough for employee, employers where you might have, say, a um, some sort of prohibition period, maybe six months or a year where you try someone out. Um, that's rough if they suddenly had to move an entire country, maybe brought them and their kids with them, spent a small fortune. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times how it's worked currently is actually most people have started working for the few archaeology sponsors before under, say, like a post-PhD visa or another visa. And then when that ran out, they've worked for that organization for a year or two. The organization decided to become a tier two sponsor. Um, so that's how it's pretty much occurred up to this point. And I actually suspect that's what's going to happen going forward. Um, people will probably hire some people who are students, work for a couple of years, get to know them, and then sponsor them for the last couple of years they need before they can get indefinitely to remain. <laughs> so so there, there aren't really any good options for short-term project hires? No. There, there's, there's almost, that's, there's basically none at the moment. Um, they're trialing a, a, they have a visa. I mentioned it, farm workers. They can come in for less than six months. Um, there's been talk about doing that from other jobs, but whether there's political will for that or not, I don't know. Um, <laughs> that might expand in the future. It might not. Uh, but at the moment, there is no good option for anyone doing less than a year project, basically. Thank you.